Do you feel exactly the same now about baby feeding as you did before you ever did it? Or before you became a professional? Hopefully not. Because with experience, our ideas about baby feeding change. And that's the same for Lex Beach. She's the guest that you heard from last week who told about her twin baby feeding experience. But her experiences didn't stop there. She has a total of seven children and also became an IBCLC whose work I have admired for years here in my state of Massachusetts. So this week, I give you part two of her story where she talks about her evolution as a nursing parent, as a parent in general, because our ideas about nursing and how we nurture our babies through nursing and parenting often go hand in hand, and then also how that helped her to evolve as a lactation professional and IBCLC as well. Enjoy this part two of Lex's story. And as you're listening, if you're thinking, I could really use some help in my own lactation journey, maybe I need to evolve in my own thinking about how I'm feeding my baby, I would love to be the person who gives you that help. You can find all my information on my website, www.quabinbirthservices.com. I can't wait to hear from you. When I began breastfeeding, I was blindsided by how difficult it was, having known only a handful of people who had ever done it and only seeing it up close a couple of times, I had a huge learning curve. Since then, I've become a doula, a childbirth educator, and an internationally board certified lactation consultant, or an IBCLC. I'm your host, Lo Nigrosh, and I welcome you to the Milk Making Minutes where we explore the systemic medical and cultural barriers that make feeding our babies so difficult so that you know your baby feeding struggles are not your fault and your triumphs really are the miracles you feel they are. I think right before I threw my back out, we were doing a thing where like I only nurse them four times a day. And it was prescribed, but that was very stressful for one of my twins. Like it, he was so anxious about it. Like, is it going to, mm. is it the time to nurse? Is it not the time to nurse? And so then when I didn't nurse him anymore, it was actually kind of like a relief for mm. him. This is the same kid who like, if anyone ever gave him a balloon, he'd like have to immediately let it go because he was like so worried about accidentally letting it go oh, that he felt better yeah. to just let it go. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah, anxiety has been has been a, a struggle in different ways for him for his whole life. But so yeah. the anxiety about me putting limits on nursing meant that it was actually easier for him to be totally weaned. Yeah. So that he was sense. better from that. And then his twin brother, a couple of weeks after this cold turkey weaning, which it was never my intention and I knew wasn't the way to do it, but it just had sort of happened. His twin was just like not fine. He was just like still every day, all day, like so sad about not nursing. My hormones were not fine. I was like, that is intense hormone crash. I am so sad. And so I ended up going back to just nursing the one twin who wasn't coping well. And I just nursed him for another six months or so um, until I got pregnant again. So um yeah, the, the weaning was different for each of them. It happened at different times. And the that's one, really interesting. You don't often yeah. hear about twins uh, weaning at different times. Yeah. And it's really great to hear a story like that because it's, you know, twins are individuals. And yep. it's really great to hear of you tuning in to each individual twin's needs when it came to yeah. breastfeeding and doing what they needed and what you needed. You know, you noticed that you definitely needed to change something. Right. And you noticed that when you had that cold turkey weaning. But then when it was totally cold turkey, you also noticed that hormone crash and then adjusted. Yeah. There too. And I did um, offer to the to the other twin that he could nurse. Yeah. Too, but it, he like couldn't. Like uh -huh. he had already forgotten how 
which yeah. is a thing that's so crazy that can happen to some right. kids. Like he yeah. sort of like held his mouth at my nipple and was like, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, yeah. So yeah, it was funny. Isn't that interesting that he kind of forgot? I, it's almost like his his anxiety about the timing kind of helped him to forget how yeah. so that he could just be free of it instead yeah. of having those limits put upon him. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, during that time, like right around that same summer, my best friend had surprise twins. So she thought she was having one baby and pushed out not a placenta, but another baby. Wow. I know. You never hear of that happening. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and she was very sick after the birth. She had had them at home and then was transferred and she was in the hospital, like very out of it on all sorts of meds and blood transfusions and everything. And so I went to help her and I ended up a like nursing her twins for her a little bit. And then also just holding them up onto her breasts every hour and a half or two hours to get them through it. And that was like my first time of really being like, this is my work. <laughs> like I'm, and it was also healing for me from, you know, because I, at that point understood some of the sadness of my birth with the twins and what hadn't happened. So that was a cool thing I got to do of just go back to nursing newborn twins for <laughs> a few days. Right. Were you already pregnant at that point? No. Okay. So then I got pregnant, um, weaned Jasper, the twin who was still nursing, like the, you know, basically the day I got pregnant or like, you know, whenever it was right around when I found out that it just, my nipples hurt so much. So I was like, oh, this is over for you. <laughs> and he had just turned three. So that felt fine. And he planned for the entire pregnancy that he was going to start nursing again when the baby was born. And I was like, okay, we'll see. But he didn't actually want to once, <laughs> once the baby came. Yeah. So, so my experience with nursing my next baby, um, there was only one of him, which was amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought I would be like a little sad to only have one baby because I had gotten so into having twins. And I was like, oh my gosh, one baby is the best. I just loved him so much. And like just to get to give yourself to one baby in that way. And oh, it was so great. Um, that thing I wanted to mention about that nursing experience that was also enlightening. So with with Zeb, I I had way too much milk really because you know, you want to make your body makes more milk with each pregnancy. And I had made enough for twins mm -hmm. the first time. So it, it was just like, I think I could have probably fed four babies. I had so mm -hmm. much milk and this poor baby who was already born 10 pounds, 10 ounces. He was the fattest baby even before he started nursing. <laughs> and then I was just like pouring milk into him. So he was gaining like a pound a week. Poor guy. He was really full. But when he was born, he was breathing too fast. He had tachypnea. Um, so he was breathing about 120 breaths per minute. Oh, Normal wow. would be 30 to 60. That involved a lot of testing. And ultimately he was hospitalized for a while. And one of the tests, it the end story is that he was totally fine. He breathed really fast for like four months and then he was totally fine. And we never know what happened. But, uh, one of the tests that they wanted to do when he was a couple weeks old was like the real test for reflux where they put a probe in a baby's nose down to their stomach. And I had to write down the start and stop time of every nursing session for mm -hmm. 24 hours, which is not something I had ever been paying attention to. I was just like feeding my baby. And it turned out he was nursing for about three minutes about once an hour. And mm. that was what he was doing. And that's totally normal. But I didn't like it, to have it written out like that. It suddenly looked so abnormal. Mm -hmm. And everyone was like so freaked out of like, oh, he can't sustain a longer feed. And it's because of the breathing and da, 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 da. And I was like, I really thought everything was fine until I started paying attention to this. Um, and spoiler alert, everything was totally fine. <laughs> and that's a really normal nursing pattern. But uh, it was a 
good insight into, because I have a lot of clients who seem to want to write down the start and stop time of every feed. Yeah. And that um, actually only makes things worse and harder. It creates a (laughs) lot of anxiety. When I have clients who have anxiety around milk supply, one of the first things I ask them to do is stop tracking for like a 72-hour period to see how they feel after the 72 hours. Yeah. And sometimes it's like, if I didn't write it down, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's how people feel. And I'm like, it pathologizes it if you're Mm -hmm. writing it down. And then you're like, why did he nurse for seven minutes this time? Usually he nurses for 12 minutes. And Mm -hmm. these are just numbers we're not meant to know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, luckily all the doctors tried to scare me about the weird nursing, but, and I did feel a little scared just because you're in that environment. But ultimately I trusted my gut that things were fine. And it sounds like you had a lot of milk and generally people who have a lot of milk, I call these people, whether it's like oversupply Mm -hmm. or just you're a milky person, (laughs) Yeah, you know, the baby tends to have shorter feeds and sometimes they feed more frequently, right? Yes, exactly. It all made sense eventually. Um, I figured the problem with with nursing Zeb was that I had so much milk that he really didn't enjoy nursing. Um, It was not a comfort to him at all. I had had these visions of like how much I had nursed the twins and like prepared the twins who are now three, almost four for that. Like I'm going to be just sitting on the couch feeding the baby a lot. And that never happened because it was like I had to sort of trick him into feeding at all. I'd have to like give him a pacifier, which I had never used with twins, but it was like the only way to soothe him sometimes and then do a bait and switch for my breast and be like sneakily feeding him. Like he would have much preferred to just have a pacifier and not even have to nurse, which also is because he also had an undiagnosed tongue tie. Um, So it was just really hard for him to control the flow of the milk. And it led to nursing strikes. So he probably, when he was two months old, had like 14 hours without nursing. Um, And that was another time where like, oh, it's so lucky that I was not pumping. Because if I had been, and I see people like this all the time, then I would have for sure just given him a bottle. And then we would have gotten into that whole thing of me having to, you know, choose between exclusive bottling or work on getting him back to the breast. But instead it was like, he has to eat eventually. And eventually he did. And I figured out ways to trick him, but it was not pleasant. It was not at all um, easy. I tried to do block feeding to reduce my supply. So I would like only feed him from one side for, you know, I think I got up to like 10 hours at a time. Wow. Um, but because I had such a large storage capacity, that didn't actually help at all. It only meant that then he really was getting too much of the high lactose milk. I'm not even going to say that word that I yes, can't stand. I know what word you're trying not to say. <laughs> <laughs> so you know he's like <laughs> having green poop and. I have an episode about this. I will link. So if anyone is curious about what word Lex is trying to avoid, I will link an episode in the show notes. So go go listen to that. Yeah. So block feeding was not the solution for us. And um, really the solution was just sort of getting through it eventually. And how long did that take? It took about seven months. And I remember I was like, I'm just going to buy a whole bunch of these pacifiers. And it's great to have a baby who will take a pacifier. And I'm going to put him down for a nap in my bed with a pacifier. And then like that day, he was like, I don't like the pacifier anymore. And I only nurse to sleep. (laughs) I was like, well, I guess this is nice that he likes nursing now. Yeah. So from then on, he loved nursing like any old kid. And he nursed until he was about four and a half. It was just easy to keep nursing him. And I also was curious to see, like, what happens if you really do that whole child-led weaning thing? Um, Uh Also, uh, during this time, my wife carried and birthed the baby. And so I wanted to keep my milk supply up so that I would be able to nurse that baby too. So I didn't want to cut my toddler back at all because I was, like, hoping he would keep my supply up so I could also nurse 
the next baby. Uh huh. And, and did so, you end up successfully nursing that baby as well? Yeah. So Leo was born when Zeb was two and a half. Um, and my wife was for sure his primary breastfeeder, especially in the beginning. We like would intentionally, we wanted her to be the one. Yes. Feeding him so that um, he would get her milk, not my toddler milk. <laughs> um, but I would nurse him for comfort. Like if, if I had just nursed the toddler and my wife is in the shower or something and the baby wants to nurse, I would let him nurse for comfort or just because I was like, it's so weird for me to have a baby and not nurse it. So I'm going to. And it was great and really pretty cool to both be nursing him. When she went back to work, when he was like three months old, um, he, I became his primary caregiver. And so I could nurse him sort of in between feeds. Like he still needed to nurse with her every four hours or so. And luckily she worked from home so we could do that. But I could hold him over for about four hours with my meager milk supply, <laughs> um, which I have no idea what it was because never pumped, but it wasn't a lot. I don't think he got a lot of milk from me, but he got enough to where he could be held over or like nurse to sleep. Mm -hmm. and did you felt, notice any increase in your supply as a result no, of the infant nursing? I didn't. Okay. Um, and some of what I read at the time when I was looking into it was like, I would actually probably have better luck to wean the toddler mm. and like induce lactation. Oh, if wow. If I really wanted to, like at With that point, pump. it's hard to change things. Like it was so established what mm -hmm. it was that. I mean, you hear of stories of people like there's a disaster and they suddenly start making all this milk to feed all their children. But mm. yeah, that wasn't my experience. I mean, I was still nursing Zeb a lot and I didn't feel like I had much milk for either of them. Mm -hmm. Was it painful um, at all to nurse the infant? It wasn't, no. Okay. I think at that point I really was, there was no pain at all. Okay. <laughs> in in nursing there was very little sensation um yeah and so m my wife and I split up when that baby was a year old so at that point um we didn't get to have the experience of like two parents both nursing a baby which was going to be really cool which was cool for that one year but we did get to have the benefit then of like whichever house he was at he still had a nursing mom with him. Oh, so yeah. that was pretty great. Um, uh -huh. And I continued to nurse him also until he was four. And I, one thing I find really fascinating about that whole experience was that once he was a toddler, like once he was one, there really wasn't a big, a noticeable difference between the experience of nursing him and nursing the toddlers I had given birth to. Yeah, because I was going to ask that. I was hoping it wasn't an insensitive question. No. I was wondering if you if you felt any difference just emotionally nursing Leo as opposed to the yeah. other children that you had nursed. Um, no, it was hormonally, it was definitely different. Um, <sighs> and I do always talk about that with my clients that especially in the in the first months postpartum when Leo would wake up at the night to feed and I'd want to be like, I'll change a diaper. Like I'll do, I'll be the dad, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I'll do the non, and I could not wake up for the life of me. Like I had exclusively breastfed twins, no issue through the night for years and it was fine. But like I was incapable of doing anything in the night without those postpartum hormones. So I always try to tell my clients that, that like if they're getting upset that their partner is so tired, even though the partner is sleeping so much more than they are, that in the absence of the hormones, it's really a lot harder. Yeah, that's really a great observation because yeah. that rage does come, you know, oh, yeah. like how can you not hear the baby? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But it's so great to hear that from somebody who has been on both sides yeah. of that equation. And in my family, we definitely figured out that like whoever gives birth to the baby is who should take care of the baby in the night. Like, because it's just easier for you. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's like, I'm talking about after the first couple of weeks when like 
usually both parents are needed in some way. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but in a long-term way, especially because we slept with our babies, whoever was nursing could just roll over, feed the baby, and no one had to know about it who wasn't the one nursing. Right, yeah. Yeah. Right. So after my ex and I split up, then Leo nursed with both of us, whichever house he was at. And I think because with my other toddlers, I also hadn't had like a huge quantity of milk at that point. It's not so much about the milk. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. I love that idea that you said mothering through breastfeeding is is the goal. I think uh, with Leo, I did have to notice like, because with some of my other kids, they could, as toddlers, they just nursed a lot still. And so if they didn't eat much that day, not really a big deal. Like they're getting so much milk still and Leo really wouldn't. So I'd have to really consciously remember to be like, oh, when he's asking to nurse this much, like I need to get him some food because Mm. I don't actually have that much milk Mm. (laughs) for him. And But Mm -hmm. he would still default to asking to nurse instead Mm -hmm. of asking for like crackers and cheese (laughs) or whatever. Yeah. And did you coordinate the weaning with your ex-wife? With my ex? No. Um, I think she suggested that we should coordinate it. And I felt like a little skeptical of us needing to. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. it felt Mm -hmm. like we had really different nursing relationships with him and different ways of doing all sorts of things with him. Okay. So, but it was a a little under wraps, I think, my last bit of nursing with him. Uh, And in in part, that was because it probably wasn't really serving him. Um, You know, he, he would... I definitely had this problem of like the toddler cries and I whip out a boob. <laughs> like, uh-huh. right. Yeah. That's a good solution, except for what are you? Nothing is really progressing here. It was right. rather regressive, I guess. Uh, yeah. You probably know by now that my number one goal is to reduce stress in the perinatal period. So I am so pleased to announce my new partnership with Feast and Fettle, which is a locally prepared home delivery meal service. I was able to select from a list of delicious meal options that got delivered right to my front door for the entire week. Some of the options I chose were zucchini lasagna, roasted carrots, some challah bread, some pork fried rice. Those are just a few of the choices that we had that we devoured. I highly recommend this service as one way to just get one more thing off your plate so that you can spend more time focusing on your family and less time worrying about all the things that you need to do. Just go to feastandfettle.com, which will be linked in the show notes. And if you use my code MILK, M-I-L-K, you can get $30 off your first week. Let Feast and Fettle do the cooking for you. If you want to have less anxiety and more confidence so that your parenting journey can feel like you always wanted it to feel, then go to my website right now so that you can have a person by your side who not only knows how you feel, but who combines my expertise of lactation with your expertise of your body and your baby to help you make the next right step in your lactation journey, because that's all you really need to do is make the next right step. And right now, that next right step is going to my website, www.quabinbirthservices.com. And I can't wait to see your name pop up in my inbox or on my phone, on my text messages. Talk to you soon. It's interesting how years down the line we can you, see that. You start to see that. Eyes. Yeah. Definitely. And I think I I was mostly able to apply those realizations to my youngest nursling. So mm-hmm. the other two babies I've had my wife um now gave birth to before we got together. Um so they're technically my stepdaughters and they were four and almost two when we got together. So I wasn't actively their parent when they were babies. Um, I did nurse the younger one alongside because I was like nursing all the babies. I was like, whatever, yeah, you can you can nurse too. So um, there, there's only one of my children, my oldest daughter, who I didn't nurse myself. Um, but there was just 
yeah, there was like a nine year stretch where I was either nursing or pregnant. Uh huh. And it was so much of everything. And then the idea of like ending that was pretty hard for me. I like, bet. What am I now? Like right. not a nursing mother, not pregnant, uh, not necessarily having another baby. That's but a huge identity shift. It was. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was weird. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because even if somebody has not had as many children as yeah. you have had, many of us struggle with that. So have you had time to process that? Do you feel like you... I think um, in my way of dealing it with it was just like, we will have another baby someday. <laughs> <laughs> we really will adopt baby it. lambs exactly. that we bottle feed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and diaper. <laughs> my current life. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think... I don't know that I did face it in a real way. I just didn't feel done. But, you know, a few years after, or I don't know how long it took to be like not nursing and not pregnant and there is no baby um, between my sixth and seventh kid. I, it felt okay. Like I felt like, oh yeah, I'm a person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, and this is fine. That probably shouldn't be my whole identity uh, anyway. But... um yeah, so then I had my seventh child um, when Leo was eight is when Edith was born. So there was a pretty big gap there. Yeah. Um, and during that interim time, like my wife and I went back and forth about who would gestate our next mm-hmm. baby. We agreed that we wanted to have a baby for a while. She was going to be the one to do it which I also was supportive of. And then because of like jobs stuff, it it made sense for me to do it. We were both going to do one, but I was going to go first. And I did feel like really excited about nursing again. I must admit (laughs) that was like a big, a big part of it for me, especially because my last experience had been that experience with Leo where I had nursed him and he had been my baby, but I hadn't had the hormones and I had really sort of missed them in a way, even though, Mm -hmm. Also, they make me crazy. But yeah, I I had missed feeling that mammalian way, Mm -hmm. which I really had to like nurture with him. It didn't come automatically. So I had Edith. Um, All of my babies, it turned out, the ones I gestated were all born by C-section, even though every time I planned for a different thing. Mm -hmm. But by the time I had Edith, the practices of C-sections were so much better in the 15 mm. years since I'd had the twins. So that was really cool. When Edith was born, um, she, you know, we had like the clear drape so I could like watch the whole thing. And they had her like crawl out of the incision, which I don't know. That seems a little bit like fake news to me, but, um, you know, no, they, they, they try to be gentle about it. Yeah, uh, uh-huh. By this point, I knew to ask, for all the anti-nausea drugs ahead of time. And like, I know a lot about like which medications I can handle and which ones I can't, and I don't want to be out of it. And so I felt good. And she just went directly on my chest. And I remember thinking like, oh gosh, like she's got like vernix, like none of my other babies had vernix. And I was like, actually I have no idea if they did Mm. because they were like rubbed down and wrapped up before (laughs) they Mm. came to me. Um, What a difference. Yeah. Not Leo, who who my ex gave birth to, was born at home. So that was a really beautiful, undisturbed birth too. But with the ones I had given birth to, it had been this bad old-fashioned C-section way. (laughs) Um, So yeah, with with Edith, she was like immediately nursing, you know, minutes after she emerged. And I remember thinking when they told me that that could happen, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to feel up for that. Like that's intense. Like you're still cut open and I don't know if I'll be able to, but like I totally could. It was fine. It was great. So she nursed really well, right? From the get-go, she did have a really intense tongue tie, which at this point I had diagnosed the other children with them since becoming an IVCLC. So I knew to anticipate that. And um, so it did really hurt a lot. She really wrecked my nipples in those first few days, but we got her tongue released when she was only five days old. And that solved that completely. It was just like... Immediately? Immediately. Like it went from 
so painful to the only word I could use was gentle. Like it just mm. felt gentle. Like I couldn't believe like it still worked because it felt mm. so fine. Like I had just mm. gotten used to like if she's on, it's hurting. Mm. It's like, is she really on? It feels this gentle? Mm. Yes. So I really wanted to not have oversupply this time. And I had done a lot of research about it and helped a lot of families. And I think it's still an area I feel like whenever I see that as a topic at a workshop, I'm like, oh yeah, I want to see what they have to say about that. Because yeah, it's really it, hard to navigate. It's not straightforward. No. Um, and you don't want to fix it too soon. Fix it. You don't want to navigate yeah. it too soon for fear right. of what could happen down the line. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I don't know, like when someone like me who has a large storage capacity, like you can't, you can't do the block feeding part. Like the mm-hmm. breast will just be like, okay, mm-hmm. sure. We'll mm-hmm. hold 15 ounces between feeds. <laughs> like that's right. fine, you know? Right. Um, and I had done some research into like inflammation in the gut being related hmm. to it. Um, so I had that idea of like, oh, I should do like a paleo diet maybe or something like that. I had sort of dabbled in that in my in the past years. Then it turned out I got really sick after Edith was born. Um, but just like constant diarrhea, like so unwell and... I was diagnosed with celiac disease, like when she was just, I don't know, less than two months old. Mm. So um, I'm intolerant of gluten, had to cut gluten out, which is something that is sometimes recommended for oversupply. Mm. So it could be that that helped. Um, It's not that I chose to do it for the oversupply. I just had to do it because I found out I had celiac disease. Mm -hmm. But what my plan was, was that I was going to pump First thing in the morning, like after I got up, I was going to just pump one breast to empty the breast that she didn't feed from. So that would sort of like, she would feed from one, I would pump the other one to empty and it would be like a reset for for the day. And some of what you read would be like, well, that's just going to exacerbate the problem. Like then your breasts will think that they should make that much milk ongoing and ongoing. But um, I had some inkling that it might work from um, people I had worked with. And for me, it totally worked. So it was also my first time pumping because now I got my pump for free from (laughs) insurance. So I had a pump and I had friends who had, the mom had had a breast reduction. So she needed a little bit of extra milk and she had a baby at the same time. So I pumped one breast like six ounces once a day for her. And it was great. Like I did not have too much milk. Edith gained the normal amount of weight. <laughs> um, not wow. a pound a week. And I didn't have clogged ducts. I didn't have mastitis. I didn't have, you know, the like where she's resistant to feeding because she's going to drown. Mm-hmm. So there were a few things. It was like maybe it was that we got her tongue tie released. Maybe it was that I had cut out gluten. And then I did this like pumping out six Mm -hmm. extra ounces, which I think otherwise, because of my storage capacity, like it just stayed in my breasts and sort of, you know, made my high lactose and all that. Yeah. Yeah, Fascinating. Yeah. Pretty cool. Then the only other funny thing about nursing Edith is that because I was very much a lactation consultant at this point, I did not fall into a, like a rabbit hole of like weighing her a lot or anything like that. But I did know more about growth charts and I have worked with a lot of like truly failure to thrive babies and stuff like that. And so when she was like six months old-ish, she really stopped gaining weight. And this is like a very roly, very roly poly baby. <laughs> um, but if you looked at her growth chart, it looked like a failure to thrive situation. Like mm. her chart was just plateauing completely. Like she did not gain any weight at all. And she hadn't been sick or anything. It's just that she had started crawling. And I think it actually was the same with my other babies too. But for some reason, like in my lactation consultant role and then postpartum hormones, anxiety, et cetera, 
I was like, oh my God, she's failure to thrive. <laughs> and oh no. My wife still makes fun of me about this. Like anytime we see a picture of Edith from like six <laughs> or seven months and she's like this Buddha baby and Meg will be like, oh, look, Edith, our failure to thrive baby. <laughs> like, because apparently look at like... Her failing to thrive in this photo. <laughs> she... Uh, I think she was like ready to have me committed. She's like, you have literally lost your mind if you think this baby is failure to thrive. But I was like, but look at her growth chart. Like, <laughs> this is not normal. Um, but that's so good for people to hear because yeah. <laughs> around that time at six or seven months, when the yes. movement starts to happen, yeah. there can be a slowing down. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes there can be a slowing down of the weight. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Yes. This can happen. I mean, really, I think all of my babies like weighed about the same at seven months as they did at age two. Like they did not gain much. They, right. they were really fat right. at six to seven months. Right. And then they turn into these like petite climbing the wall toddlers. Right. Um, I And I felt that way when I didn't have the numbers and the chart in front of me about the other babies. I was like, they're clearly fine. But... um. Yeah, that was the one like with my lactation consultant hat on. Right. I, I felt a little worried. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever bring this concern to your providers? No, but I did feel a little alarmed that they weren't concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Why isn't my doctor sending me off to the emergency room? Yeah. <laughs> Why don't they care about this growth chart? <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah. No, I uh, I didn't bring up the concern with anybody other than my wife, thankfully. So I didn't have to make <laughs> too much of a fool out of myself. Um, yeah. And then Edith, I just, I did a different thing with her. I didn't do the like, every time she cries, I whip my boob out. I mm. really felt like, I'm going to calm you down. And like, let's talk about this. And then mm. if we're going to nurse, like we might still nurse, but I didn't ever like, nurse her in the moment of upset. I felt like I had learned that I wanted to do things a little differently there. Um, and I think that was definitely for the best. Just felt like much more confident and able to set boundaries around all sorts of things with her. Um, I mean, what, as one should, if they're going to have seven children, you better get better at it as you go, right? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. You uh, had teenagers by then, so you had learned how to deal with strong I, emotions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The hardest part of with Edith was like having to teach the teenagers that they couldn't just like give her whatever she wanted. Mm. And they're like, but she's so cute. I was like, yes, but we are raising a human. <laughs> <laughs> how do you want her to turn out? Right. Um, yeah, and I and then part of that ended up meaning that I did not nurse Edith as long as I nursed the babies before her, which is sort of a different trajectory than a lot of people have. Um, mm -hmm. I think you tend to have a story of like each baby nurse is a little longer than the one before. Um, but uh, yeah, Edith, I also did not enjoy sleeping with her after, you know, by the end of her first year, she just was so wiggly. So the other kids had slept with me until they were like at least two. And she was out and slept in a crib. She was our first of the seven kids to have a crib. Wow. Um, starting when she was about one and like slept through the night. We didn't, you know, have to sleep train her or anything. It just happened. But it was, it was a different experience and it was, it was fun. And it was funny with the pumping also because we, we hadn't ever pumped or used bottles none of the first six children ever had a bottle, which wasn't as principled as I just made that sound. It just was like, it wasn't necessary. It didn't come up really. Mm -hmm. um, and so with Edith, because I was pumping for my friend, I was like, well, we should also give her a bottle. Like she could have that skill. And mm -hmm. I also want to be able to leave her. I like, I don't want to be like, anxiously attached, which I realized I had been with some of the others. So I made myself leave her with my wife and I was like, and here is two ounces of milk in, in the bottle and you can give it to her. And my wife would be like, uh-huh, yeah, we're going to be fine. Like, <laughs> She really never wanted to give her the bottle. She was like, it's not as like you're going to be gone for two hours. Like, Right. The baby we'll does not need that much milk. But it did give me peace of mind, I think. Yes, exactly. To leave yeah. the milk, even if she hardly ever had it. 
Yeah. Um, I think we let like the older kids also wanted to give her a bottle at some point. And I was like, yeah, you can. Sure. Go yeah. for it. So thinking back, I'm just, I'm just thinking about the people, your friend who had the surprise twins that mm-hmm. you nursed their babies and then all of your seven children and then you donated milk. <laughs> how, how many total babies have had your milk? Oh, gosh. Well, I really don't know because I ended up being a milk donor in like a bigger way after my Uh friend's baby didn't need it anymore. But um, the babies I actually know who have had my milk, it would just be the six I fed plus the eight, nine. Yeah. That's amazing. Nine babies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doesn't sound like that many, does it? It, it's a lot more than most you know, people. <laughs> I always feel that way, like, because my twins are in college now, and so they're often not home. I mean, mostly they live at college. Uh-huh. Um, uh, so we've gotten used to, like, only three or four kids home for dinner, and it's uh-huh. always just like, you have no children. And I think other people have this many children and think it's a lot. It, it, like, it really does not feel like very many. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Edith will say, like, we need more kids, Mom. I'm like, I agree. <laughs> Do need more kids. Oh, that's great. Well, I thank you so much for sharing oh, yeah, your for incredible me. journeys. It's a unique story. It really is. Between, um, you know, nursing not only your own children, but your wife's children, Um, and that experience that hasn't been told on the podcast before in my memory, at least, um, I don't think so. So, um, it was, you know, I think it's a kind of thing where like some people obviously don't even want to give donor milk to their children. Like that feels weird to them. You know, mm, it feels mm -hmm. like such a personal bodily fluid or something. And then other people have that experience of like, uh, I wouldn't want my baby to like suckle from another woman's breast. Like that Mm -hmm. feels somehow like almost like an infidelity kind of a feeling to them. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. but I, I guess I just never felt that way at all about any of it, either any direction. Like, yeah, I I remember reading when I was a kid that a manatee, a manatee mother will nurse any hungry baby. And I was like, I am a manatee. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's how I feel. Yeah. Uh, Have you watched? (laughs) Oh, go ahead. Well, I was also going to say that when my twins were babies and I, I lived with my mom for about a month while my um, my first wife was away being a sea kayak guide. Uh, so I took the twin babies to live with my mom and she was like, can I try nursing them? Like, I just want to remember what it feels like. And I was like, sure, like, go for oh, it. Uh-huh. Uh, and like my sister who hadn't had a baby was like, can I try? And I was like, yeah, go for it. Like that was, that's sure. amazing. Yeah. Just yeah. anyone like nurse the babies. Like, yeah. <laughs> Um, but the funny part about that is that my mom got thrush from nursing. Oh no, because your babies had thrush. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. we were like plagued with this systemic yeast situation. But yeah, um, oh no. Well, that's how <laughs> humans evolved, right? With these aloe mothers who yeah. would nurse babies. And I don't know if you've watched uh, Secrets of the Elephants on Disney Plus or not. Oh, I've seen some of it, maybe. But there is, they show this baby elephant who, if it shows this clip of this mom, this baby elephant go up to its own mother and tries to nurse and the mother just won't have it. She doesn't want to nurse right now. And so then it goes off to another elephant who doesn't even have a baby, but that elephant just lets it nurse for comfort. Um, yeah. And it, and the the documentarian says... Uh, elephants do this. The babies can just nurse from anyone. And this yeah. is a common mammalian trait. So it is. We well, have it lost makes, it you know, in many human cultures, but they say that like human mothers, you, you know, used to sit around and like pass their babies in the circle. And that was like mm-hmm. vaccinating them all, like little dose of this immune system, a little dose of this immune system. Right. Um, yeah. And my daughter. Liesel, whom my wife gave birth to, she's the one who was almost two when we got together um, and I did nurse her. But like I had been nursing her 
like she nursed everybody like in Northampton who was mm. lactating. She would just like go up to them and be like, my nurse. And people no. would be like, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> but yeah, I don't think any of my kids would have done that. But um, uh-huh. the ones I birthed, they were a little more particular. Um, they did all try to nurse like with the mother who didn't give birth to them. But it, it would be like more funny for them than. Yeah. Yeah. Than like a thing that they would go back to. But yeah, Liesl said, what's the quote we say? She said, my nurse people and friends. <laughs> She's like listing all the people she nurses. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. But now this podcast is going to make me sound like such a wackadoo of, of all the milk. But I do um, also am a normal person who... <laughs> um, uh, no, you are not regarded in, as as a wackadoo in this area. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you <laughs> are regarded as a highly trained, uh, very compassionate lacti- uh-uh. lactation consultant who sees lots of clients and patients and meets them where they are. So just because that this is, is your journey, you do right. not expect that to be everybody else's journey. So yeah. just like when I tell people I nursed through three years of pain, but mm-hmm. I never would expect anybody else to do that because that was my story. I don't expect anyone else's story to be the same. And that is the reputation that you have as well. So, you know, your reputation as a lactation consultant is somebody who meets people where they are. And regardless of what they are choosing for their families, I think you have the reputation of helping them make that goal, whether that's exclusively breastfeeding for years or changing the plan Mm -hmm. um, to meet their family's goals. That's the reputation that you have, which is why I adore you so much. Because... um, you are not a wackadoodle. <laughs> you you help families meet their needs. Um, yeah, I think for me as a lactation consultant, like I'm interested in the science of lactation in a way, um, and I'm also just like I want to get to the root of of a struggle. Um, I have felt so frustrated by just like the band aid solutions and the pediatricians who are like, well, now the baby's gaining weight, so it's fine. I'm like, but we don't even know why it wasn't gaining weight before. Like, we have mm-hmm. to figure this out. We have to do some science. Um, mm-hmm. But I also think that after all these years of doing it, like the the milk part of it matters so much less to me than it did at the beginning. I feel like it's about the relationship between parent and baby. And like, that's what I want to protect. That's what I want to nurture. And sometimes that means through the breast and breastfeeding and mothering through breastfeeding and doing whatever we can to get this part, that part of it working. And sometimes it means something totally different. Um, and I think, you know, we, we talk about because we have all these babies and obviously are crazy, um, like fostering, potentially adopting, in the future. And I think I used to think like, if I were going to adopt a baby, I would absolutely induce lactation. And how could I have a baby and not nurse? And now I'm like, I definitely don't think I would do that. I think I would Mm -hmm. like very gladly (laughs) bottle feed a baby and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, probably get some human milk donated and stuff like that. But, but it wouldn't be about that. It would be, it would be about the way you can connect with a baby, which, you know, nursing can be an easy way to be a mammal Mm-hmm. parent to a baby. But if it's not an easy way, there are, are also a lot of other ways. Right. Yeah. I had a guest who, uh, in one of my early episodes, who desperately wanted to breastfeed. And she had had a breast reduction early in her tw- uh, earlier in her life. And it turned out she didn't make the milk. And she had joined a La Leche League. They continued to welcome her into her group. She came, she formula fed her babies with a bottle. And she said something that has stuck with me, which was, I continue to nurture my babies in the same way I would have if they had been breastfed. I just did it with a bottle of formula. Absolutely. You know, and I, and I think that we can, even as Lactation consultants, my goal is to help parents learn how to do that regardless of the feeding totally. mechanism. Right. Um, even if that means changing the plan and helping them feel good with their final plan and learning the tools that breastfeeding gives us, even if it's not actually with human milk. Absolutely. 
Yeah. So I thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories. It's amazing. Um, Where can people find you and connect with you if they would like to do so? Uh, Well, I do have a website about lactation. Mostly I just work at this birth center now. Um, But I will send you the link to my website if people want to read more about me. And then I do have an online breastfeeding class. Um, Two of them actually. One is for expectant parents and one is for parenting um, breastfeeding newborns in the first 12 weeks. And it's through a company called Mighty Milk, which is not my company, but I am the lactation consultant and it's my content and it's me standing up there. I haven't made myself watch it because that's so painful, but, (laughs) um, you know, it shows babies nursing, um, in different positions and talks a lot about the science of how milk is made. And then a lot about like why frequency of feeding matters so much. Um, so worth, worth checking out. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Awesome. All of that will be linked in the show notes. Great. Thanks for having me, Lo. If you haven't fallen in love with Lex by this point, I don't know if you can fall in love because she's just an amazing person. And I was so thankful that she was willing to spend so much time sharing her stories and her thoughts on breastfeeding and how people have been impacted by the systemic barriers that exist and how she was impacted And if you want to connect with her, she is in my Milk Making Minutes community group on Facebook. So be sure to jump into that group so that you can process and discuss the barriers that impacted you and that impact so many people across the globe to make baby feeding more difficult than it needs to be and so that we can make change because it does not need to be as hard as it is. And speaking of barriers... If you want to eliminate one more barrier from your life, I highly recommend you go to feastandfettle.com and use my code MILK, M-I-L-K, to get $30 off your first week of amazing home-cooked meals delivered right to your front door. They are so good, and literally all you have to do is heat and serve them. I promise you won't be disappointed. Check it out. Bye.